What is a superfluid, okay? What is a superfluid? Superfluid, uh, the sort of poster child example is liquid helium. Here's liquid helium. Liquid helium, you cool it, it bubbles, okay? This is just boiling, all kinds of things happen. Once you reach a particular temperature, three degrees Kelvin or so, its behavior completely changes, okay? Did you see it, start, it stopped boiling entirely? When the temperature is lowered, at some point, it completely stops. Let me tell you what's going on. Let me tell you what's going on, okay? Normally, when you take a fluid and you cool it, eventually, it forms a solid, right? That's what happens with water. And the reason is that you have molecules in the liquid moving around because of the temperature. They're jittering, jittering around. As you cool them, their jitter slows down and eventually allows them to bind, to bind into a crystalline structure, very ordered structure, and that's the ice phase, okay? However, you know from quantum mechanics that even at absolute zero temperature, atoms are not sitting still. They will have a quantum jitter, just due to quantum mechanics. What happens with a superfluid is that that quantum jitter is enough to prevent the, the substance from forming a solid. Does that make sense? So the quantum jitter is enough to keep it into fluid, even at zero temperature. So liquid helium, you can cool it all the way to zero temperature, in principle, and it, would, it will remain a fluid. Now, you could say, this sounds very nice, thank you, Justin, but why in the world does this have anything to do with dark matter, right? It sounds like a crazy, why does dark matter behave like liquid helium? In fact, superfluids are not that strange of a beast. Of course, we never really see them in our you know, day-to-day -day experience because our day-to-day -day experience is at much higher temperature than three degrees Kelvin. But in principle, there are two things you need to have a superfluid. People do it, for example, just with cold atoms in the laboratory. You cool down a bunch of atoms together and eventually they can form superfluid. So really, the two conditions you need for superfluidity are the following. How, would, how why would it be that dark matter can be a superfluid? First of all, you need a lot of these particles. You need a lot of dark matter around in order to be dense enough in order to form superfluid. So if you want the first condition to have superfluid is that you have a lot of atoms, you have a lot of dark matter. I say atoms because I think of them actually as dark matter atoms. But. Okay, so you need a lot of them. Now we know the total mass of dark matter that we need, let's say in galaxies, so we know the total mass. So if you want to have a lot of dark matter particles, it means that each particle has to be light much, you know, quite light. So when you work out the numbers, it turns out that the mass of the dark matter particle has to be 0.1% the mass of the proton. Much lighter than what people think about when they think about weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs, which are much more heavy than this. But people talk about other types of dark matter particles that have masses in that range. So it's not crazy. They just happen to be light particles. Secondly, they have to be, uh, they have to be cold enough. And dark matter is pretty cold, right? It's one of the properties. Dark matter, it, it just has to be in thermal equilibrium at a very cold temperature. Now, when you work, work out the numbers as to what, remember I told you for liquid helium, it was, it was three degree Kelvin, that transition. If you work out what would be the critical temperature for transition to superfluid state for dark matter, you plug in the numbers, doesn't have to be, doesn't have to come out with, it could be any crazy number. It turns out to be milli Kelvin. And that's interesting because in the laboratory with cold atom system, milli Kelvin is actually a reasonable number. With lithium atoms, I'm not saying dark matter is lithium atoms, okay? Don't get me wrong. It's something different. But when you look in the laboratory and you take lithium atoms, you find the critical temperature is 0.2 milli Kelvin. It's not a crazy number, okay? It's another hint that maybe these things are actually some kind of dark atoms. Again, not made of ordinary matter, but some form of uh, dark matter atom. Okay. So here's the picture we have in mind in that story. We have in mind that in the Milky Way or around any galaxy, there is our dark matter halo in blue, but in, this, in the interior, there is a superfluid bubble where the dark matter really behaves like a superfluid. All right, that's the picture. Now, why does that have anything to do with MOND or explaining properties of galaxies? That's just a statement, right, that we think there's a superfluid phase. One thing, uh, oh, I should say one other thing. Uh, we're about to propose that in fact, MON has to do with this superfluid nature. Now, as we've said earlier, galaxies work beautifully well with MON, galaxy clusters do not. So that has to be explained, right? If, I, if I'm gonna say something nice about galaxies, I also have to explain something about galaxy clusters. 
So here's the key piece of physics. The temperature uh, of, the, of, the, of the dark matter is set by how fast they're moving in the halo. And so if in the dark, in the, in the, ma in the massive uh, object that we're talking about. So in a galaxy, you can work out that the dark matter motion of the particles gives them a temperature of order 0.1 millikelvin. So below this critical temperature, you see? So in galaxies, you expect them to be superfluid, at least near the center. There's a superfluid inside galaxies. Galaxy clusters, as we've said, are much more massive. So a dark matter particle in a, in a galaxy cluster is, is whizzing around much faster because there's more gravity there, right? There, you work out what the temperature would be for uh, dark matter particles. It's 10 millikelvin above the critical temperature. So in galaxy clusters, you see, galaxy clusters are hotter in this sense. And therefore, in galaxy clusters, you're not in the superfluid state. You're in this ordinary dark matter phase. And that's what distinguishes galaxies from galaxy clusters, OK? Now, I haven't told you yet why MON comes out of the story, right? Modified Newtonian dynamics. Now, one amazing thing about superfluidity, once you reach superfluid state, like we saw with, with helium, liquid helium, what you noticed in the movie was that initially, the atoms of liquid helium were moving all over the place. You reach the superfluid state, and then they stopped. Why did they stop? The physics of this is remarkable. What happened, and this is really quantum mechanics, it's the most striking manifestation of quantum mechanics. Once you reach this critical three degree Kelvin temperature, what happens with the superfluid is that at that moment, the individual atoms of liquid helium are no longer independent entities. Does that make sense? They lose their individuality. Now they have, because of quantum mechanics, they cannot individually whiz around, which is why you see the boiling stop. They start behaving coherently, in unison, if you want. They have what are called collective excitations. You don't excite yourself independently. You have to, all in the room, create a wave, like we see in the stadium. And that's exactly what happens. It's a collective motion, just like the wave in the stadium. These are known as sound waves. These are the excitations of a superfluid, or phonons. Now, phonons, here's a video, okay? You see that they're moving just like in the wave in the stadium, moving collectively, okay? Now, there is one thing, this is for a particular type of solid, animation for a solid. There's one thing that is not captured by this animation. You see that the atoms, as the wave is moving, they're going up and down, like you would do in a stadium. The kind of wave we're talking about is not going up and down. It's moving sideways. We call this longitudinal wave. It's actually how the sound from my mouth to your ear is propagated. It looks more like this. You see that the atoms in the movie, each, each individual atom is moving back and forth. Right, that's the red dot. It's just moving back and forth. But collectively, there is a over density which is propagating in a particular direction. That's the wave, you see, but each atom is only doing this. Unfortunately, this animation didn't capture the fact that they're sort of coherent. The other animation showed that they're coherent. So you have to, in your mind, combine the two, okay? So it looks more like an ordered thing that I showed you before, but the atoms are moving this way as opposed to that way. Okay, so these are the excitation of the superfluid. So in other words, in the galaxy, once you're in the, near the center of the galaxy, I imagine, that's my theory anyways, that the dark matter particles are not whizzing around in the way you'd imagine them to be. They're not whizzing around. They're behaving like liquid helium, like a fixed, you know, coherent bulk of stuff sitting there. And moreover, when you excite the dark matter, you excite the dark matter, it doesn't excite it by having a particle whizzing around. It, it excites it with these coherent waves in the, in, near the center of the galaxy. So completely different than what people, that we normally think of dark matter as being individual particles. Now, the key idea of this proposal is that the, uh, these phonons, and this requires some mathematical details, which I cannot show you, but uh, that the superfluid phonons are actually responsible for mediating a force, and it's a mon force, okay? I will give you a gist for why this may be true, but for the moment, just take my word for it that mathematically, these phonons can mediate a force on top of gravity, which looks like mon, precisely the square root form that we discussed, okay? Now, why does it have anything to do uh, with MOND? And the reason is, it's really uh, what, what got me, the process by which I came about to this idea, was really because of a mathematical analogy. 
you look at the theory mathematically that you need to explain MOND, and it looks like the theory precisely of those sound waves of a superfluid. In fact, it looks eerily similar to uh, the particular theory of a known cold atom system in the laboratory. Not exactly the same, but similar in spirit, okay? So it's the mathematical structure that led me to think that, wait, maybe this MON phenomenon is describing superfluidity, and dark matter can certainly be a superfluid. Now, as we said, it naturally distinguishes between galaxies and galaxy clusters. We've said it before, so galaxies are very cold, and therefore they will have a superfluid, and therefore there you'll expect to have MON behavior. As we said, this explains these beautiful fits of rotation curves. It explains why you have this conspiracy of Tolly Fisher. It comes about because of the superfluid nature of dark matter. Whereas in galaxy clusters, as we've said, galaxy clusters are much hotter. There is no uh, superfluid phase in the galaxy cluster, and therefore no mod. I want to qualify this because this will be important later on. When I say there is no superfluid, it's not quite true. There is a little bit of superfluid near the very center of the cluster, because there you don't have much mass, and so therefore temperature can be cold. This will be important later, okay? So near the center of the cluster, you have a little uh, superfluid bubble just surrounding the central galaxy in the cluster. But for most of it, it's all ordinary dark matter. Imagine our little bucket of liquid helium, which we cool down, so now it looks nice and still. And imagine you start rotating the bucket. Now, when you rotate a bucket of water, water rotates with the bucket. Liquid helium does not, actually. It will remain still. But at some point, if you spin it too fast, what will happen is something has to give, okay? It cannot stay still. And what it does, instead of starting to spin homogeneously as a, as a whole solid, as a whole, as a whole liquid, what happens is it starts forming vortices, little vortices inside the fluid. And that's what represented in these sequence of pictures. As you spin it faster and faster, Vortex is exactly like your toilet flushing, right? It's, it's things moving around circularly. And you see that you develop more and more of these vortices as you spin the fluid faster. Now, the galaxy itself is spinning, right? The dark matter in the galaxy may well have its own spin. And therefore, if it's superfluid, it should not spin homogeneously like a ball. It should start forming vortices. In fact, just one more thing. This is actually a beautiful uh, experimental result um, with liquid helium by a group at University of Maryland. They show, actually, they're able to map these vortices. You see them as lines. What I want you to see from this graph is that these vortices are not just standing still, boringly, you know, whizzing around. They're actually, they're actually interacting, they're combining, they're reconnecting, et cetera. It's a very dynamical system, these set of vortices. It's very cool, okay? So therefore, the picture we have in mind as one possible observational signature is that, in fact, the galaxy, the galaxy, uh, sh the dark matter in the superfluid bubble should have all these little vortices. Now, if you ask, great, how come I don't see them, okay? First of all, there are many of them. If you estimate how many vortices there are, there will be 100 of them within the size of the solar system. But they're very small. In thickness, they're like one millimeter. So the mass that they have is very small, okay? So it's not clear whether you can easily see them. For example, you can say, well, if they're there, they're massive, I should see, I should feel their presence in the solar system. They're very feeble lines of density, okay? So we're still thinking about how you might go about finding those vortices, but it is, they're in principle there, if you believe this idea. Now, a very interesting, and you actually saw this in the movie I showed you earlier about this beautiful cosmic web in blue and things coming together and so forth, forming these filaments. What you saw there, if you looked closely, was actually that these little lumps, right, connected by filaments, some of them were actually merging together. They'd come together, they'd merge, form bigger lumps. That's actually a very important part of our understanding of the formation of the structure in our universe, is that small lumps can come together and form bigger lumps. Let me show you this, and I'll tell you the physics of why this happens. It's actually not so, it's actually very interesting why, why these galaxies merge. 